Today on The Voice of Prophecy, we're going to dig into one of the darkest stories of political intrigue the world has ever seen, and we're going to talk about the inconvenience of murder. This is not your everyday broadcast, so find a comfortable seat and get ready for a life-changing look at the worst crime in history. As you can well imagine, career politicians put a lot of stock in public opinion polls, and for pretty good reason. If you want to know your odds of getting elected, it might be a good idea to talk to the people who are going to vote. Do they like you? Do they like your platform? Do they agree with the things you want to do? That kind of information can help you decide where to spend campaign money, where to advertise, which issues to talk about, and it also tells you which issues might not be all that important. Now. Those polls can also mean that politicians aren't always as principled as you'd like them to be because who could really resist the temptation to change your position to match the polls? You've got to know that opinion polls have sometimes had an undue influence. And of course, sometimes public opinion polls just plain get it wrong. In the 2013 gubernatorial race in Virginia, several polls put Terry McAuliffe way out in front, predicting he was going to win with a double-digit lead. And of course, they weren't entirely wrong because he did win, but not like the polls predicted. The lead was more like two and a half points. So the pollsters got it wrong. And in the world of polling, that's a lot wrong. Then in the 2012 presidential race, the people at Gallup were a long ways off. They said, look, Mitt Romney is going to win. And you know, that didn't happen. Gallup got it wrong. So apparently polls are sometimes useful, public opinion polls, that is, and sometimes they're kind of useless. And I suppose the pollsters can get it wrong for a number of reasons, because the voting public can be very fickle. It can change its mind just a day after you ask them, and one day they want one thing, the next day they want something else. It can be really fickle. It's hard to know. Now, what I find fascinating is that one of the most stunning examples of public opinion getting it wrong happened nearly 2,000 years ago in the streets of Jerusalem. In a matter of one week, the mood of the public shifted dramatically. At the beginning of the week, crowds of adoring supporters were excited to watch Jesus ride into the city. They threw their coats in the street. They sang his praises. They waved palm branches as if he were royalty. But by the end of the same week, the crowds were calling for his death. Of course, it's entirely possible that we're looking at two different crowds, and I'll admit that might be the case. But still, you've got to wonder, how much overlap was there between the crowd on Palm Sunday and the crowd on Good Friday? How many people were at both events? How many people joined in the frenzy, whether good or bad? At the very least, if you were an outside observer, the stark difference between the grand entry and the shameful execution would seem like a monumental shift in public opinion. Or it would represent one of the most sharply polarized cities in the history of the world. I mean, just think about this. On Sunday, it looks like Jesus is about to become the new king of Israel. On Friday... They're spitting his name with disgust and calling for his death. On Sunday, they're shouting his name with delight. On Friday, they're shouting insults and hoping he'll die. But in reality, things didn't shift quite as quickly as it seems. There were several people in town that week who knew the truth. There had been a rising tide of hatred, a long-time rising conspiracy to kill Jesus. It wasn't a new idea. It wasn't something that just happened. While the crowds were singing his praises and throwing their coats on the road, there were others in the background quietly plotting to have him murdered, quietly hoping they could turn the tide of public opinion. And the one person who really knew the truth was Jesus himself. From what we read in the four Gospels, the historical record of Jesus' life, he knew full well that public support and adoration that he was receiving at the beginning of the week wasn't the way the same week was going to end. He knew the truth. They were going to kill him. In fact, people had been scheming to murder Jesus his entire life. It really started when he was just a child, when some Chaldean wise men suddenly rose into town looking for the king of the Jews. And they started their search in the one place that news would not be welcome, the palace of the current king of the Jews, Herod. 
And maybe it's useful to think about Herod's predicament, why he would not be excited by the real king of the Jews. According to history, Herod was something of an outsider. He was an Edomite, one of the descendants of Esau. And of course, Jacob, the brother of Esau, was the father of Israel. Edomites were not considered to be real Jews by quite a number of groups, including the Pharisees. So even though Herod said he was a Jew, even though he spent a great deal of time and money proving it, he upgraded and renovated the temple in Jerusalem, many people disagreed. They thought he was illegitimate, an outsider, a Roman appointee. So his claim to the throne was somewhat contentious to start with, and when strangers suddenly arrived looking for the real king of the Jews, he panicked. He gave the order that every male child under the age of two, any child born in the region of Bethlehem, should be put to death. So you can see that Jesus began his life as a political target. Human power and human ambition have always cast a shadow over Jesus' life. Political intrigue had always threatened his existence, and that shadow continued to hang over him until the day he rode into the city, Palm Sunday, when the crowds were shouting his name and singing his praises. The public opinion poll was clearly in Jesus' favor that day, but the lifelong plot to kill him was only getting stronger by the moment. Go all the way back to the beginning of Jesus' public ministry and you'll see this. Luke's account puts Jesus in the synagogue of Nazareth after 40 days of fasting in the desert. And apparently Jesus was no stranger to that congregation because the Bible tells us it was his custom to go there on Sabbath and stand up and read the scriptures. He was an active participant in the life of that church. And Luke says that day Jesus stood up to read from the book of Isaiah. And this is what he said. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, I don't know how anybody could be upset with that, because that sounds like good news. But what Jesus read really stirred up the congregation, because he finished by saying he was the fulfillment of that prophecy. I am Messiah, he said. And they said, who is this? Who's this guy who claims to be the anointed of God? We know this guy. We knew him as a kid. How can he think he's Messiah? This is blasphemy. And that's when things got really tense. Jesus knew they were doubting, so he brought up their uncomfortable past. He told it like it was, which sometimes doesn't help you much in the polls. You rejected Elijah, he said. You rejected Elisha. And now you're rejecting me. Your hard hearts closed the door to God's blessing in the past. And in the past, only Gentiles were blessed by God's prophet. You were so stubborn, God had to go to the Gentiles. And apparently, that statement was the straw that broke the camel's back. I mean, who was this man to claim he knew the mind of God? Who is this man to call them doubters and unbelievers? Who is Jesus to sit in judgment over them? So the Bible says they got out of their seats, they took him to the edge of town, and they tried to throw him off a cliff. It was a murder attempt. But passing through their midst, Luke says, he went away. They found themselves powerless to harm him. It wasn't time yet. They couldn't kill him. But eventually the time would come, and the enemy would be allowed to touch the Son of God. Now, I'm going to take a very short break because I want you to have a very special gift from the Voice of Prophecy, a gift to help you know this Jesus better, but then I'll come right back. Life and its daily challenges can weigh us down, even when we have the best of intentions, leaving us with more questions than answers. Is it possible to have true peace and happiness in life? Are you searching for answers to this and other of life's most challenging questions? The Discover Bible Guides will help you find the answers you are looking for. Visit us at BibleStudies.com or give us a call at 888-456-7933 for your free Discover Bible Guides. Study online or on our secure website or have the free guides mailed right to your home. There is never a cost or obligation. The Discover Bible Guides are our free gift to you. Find answers in guides like The Secret of Happiness and Is God Fair? You'll find answers to the things that matter most to you in each of the 26 Discover Bible Guides. Visit BibleStudies.com and begin your journey today to discover answers to life's deepest questions. And we have lessons just for the kids in your life. Your kids will love KidZone at BibleStudies.com. 
They'll enjoy the colorfully illustrated stories and interactive lessons in the 14 Kids' Own Bible Guides. And while you're online, be sure to visit us at VOP.com. Years ago, when the psalmist wrote, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he was obviously talking about his own experience. But I'm convinced he was also talking about Jesus. And in fact, a lot of the Psalms have clear prophetic references to the life of Christ. His life wasn't going to be easy. As it turns out, the shadow of death stretched over the entire period of his public ministry. Actually, all the way from his birth to the cross. So when the crowds were adoring him that day as he rode into Jerusalem, it was really something of an oddity. Jesus had always drawn crowds. There were always people who were magnetically drawn to him, people who recognized his divinity, people who accepted his ministry. But the shadow of death was always there. In in fact, as you read through the Gospels, and the Gospel of John in particular, there seems to be this steady, unrelenting march toward the cross, toward that horrible moment when our human race would murder the Son of God. And at certain points, the plot to kill Jesus came dangerously close to the surface. They almost succeeded on several occasions. Herod tried and failed because it wasn't time. The crowd in Nazareth tried to throw him off a cliff, but Jesus walked away because it wasn't time. And then came the moment when he healed a man at the pool of Bethesda, a man paralyzed for 38 years. And you would think that people would bask in that miracle, that they would celebrate the arrival of someone who could turn back the cruel curse of sin and suffering. You would think they would be happy that someone could heal the sick. But Jesus healed the man on the Sabbath, and the religious authorities were immediately furious. They wanted him dead. John's Gospel tells the story like this in John chapter 5 and verse 18. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. You know, I would love to think that the crowds on Palm Sunday were always there, that people always worshipped Jesus, that they always loved him. But the truth is, people wanted him dead. He threatened their understanding of God. He threatened the paper-thin political stability they had under Roman occupation. They couldn't understand why Jesus said the things he said. They couldn't understand why he did the things he did. And tragically, John had to write at the beginning of his gospel that Jesus came to his own and his own people did not receive him. They didn't recognize him. He was the light that came into the world and the world didn't know him. And the real truth of the matter was, Jesus didn't break the Sabbath. How could the Creator violate His own commandments? How could the Creator violate His own sacred day? The truth is, He didn't do a single thing that was out of bounds, because by the end of His ministry, Jesus was able to say that He had kept all of His Father's commandments. But the ruling class, the ones who believed themselves to be the guardians of Israel, they couldn't see it. They had perverted the practice of their religion to the point where it barely resembled the faith that God had given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Their understanding was compromised. They had added so many regulations, so many man-made rules, that even the Sabbath, a day made for man, a day to be a delight, a gift to the human race, well, it was the worst day of the week for a lot of people. The God of the Sabbath was almost invisible under the weight of human religion. And so when Jesus came in person... The religious leaders couldn't see him for who he really was. They didn't recognize him. The level of mistrust, the level of hatred against Jesus rose to such a fevered pitch that it actually became common knowledge that they wanted to kill him. This wasn't even a secret. At one point, the crowds asked this question in John chapter 7, Is not this the man they seek to kill? They knew it. Everybody knew it. They knew the Sanhedrin wanted Jesus dead. But how do you kill someone and get away with it? How do you take an innocent man, a man who's done nothing wrong, how do you get rid of him? How do you pull off his execution when the real reason you need him gone has nothing to do with God and everything to do with politics? The plot to kill Jesus might have been a long time in the making, but pulling it off was going to be really tricky. His enemies didn't even have the authority to kill him because they were a captive nation. They were subjects of the Roman Empire, and they had no right to dish out capital punishment. 
Now, that should have been a clue that they might actually be dealing with Messiah because that was hinted at in an ancient prophecy. Shortly before Jacob died, he predicted that the scepter would not depart from Judah till Shiloh comes. That's Genesis 49. It wouldn't depart till the appearance of Messiah. And this was the moment that had come during Jesus' life. After the death of Herod, the Romans suddenly banished the next king, and they sent him to Europe, and they replaced him with a Roman governor. And it was at that point, as the Roman governor came into play around the year 6 or 7 AD, it was that time that the legal power of the Sanhedrin was dramatically curtailed, and they lost the ability to hand out the death sentence. They literally lost the scepter. It departed from Judah. The prophecy had come to pass. So these guys should have known it was time for Messiah to appear. But it's amazing how political ambition can blind you. It's amazing how power and pride can keep you from acknowledging God. Killing Jesus? It wasn't going to be easy. Because the Sanhedrin didn't have the legal right to do it. But that wasn't their biggest problem, not by a long shot. I'll be back in a moment to tell you what the biggest problem was. Are you searching for answers to life's most difficult questions? Answers to help you make sense of the things that are happening right now in your life? Answers to the deepest questions in life, like, can God really forgive me? Guilt and shame can be terrible burdens to carry and can leave us wondering if God really can love us and accept us. Are you wondering if there really is a chance for true happiness in this life? If there is a secret to living a happy, contented life in a world of uncertainty? Well, if you're searching for answers to these and other of life's most challenging questions, we are here to help. The Discover Bible Guides will help you find the answers you're looking for. Visit us at BibleStudies.com or give us a call at our toll-free number, 888 888- Four five six seven nine three three for your free Discover Bible Guides. Study online on our secure website or have the free guides mailed right to your home. There is never a cost or obligation. The Discover Bible Guides are our free gift to you. You'll find answers in guides like, Does my life really matter to God? And From Guilty Sinner to Forgiven Saint. You'll find answers to the things that matter most to you in each of the 26 Discover Bible Guides as the major themes of the Bible come to life. Begin your journey to discover answers to life's deepest questions and log on today to BibleStudies.com. The enemies of Jesus considered him a threat to their personal authority, to the empire, to this little power structure they had built for themselves, and they wanted him dead. Past attempts to kill Jesus had failed, and every time they failed, Jesus told people, Look, my hour hasn't come. He knew he would die, but not before it was time. According to the prophet Daniel, Messiah would be cut off in the midst of the week after three and a half years, so Jesus knew it wasn't time. Not yet. But now, with adoring crowds celebrating his arrival in Jerusalem, the hour was fast approaching. Behind the scenes, the religious authorities were plotting to have Jesus killed. They didn't have the legal authority to do it, but that was the least of their problems. Getting the Roman stamp of approval, getting permission to kill, that was only a formality, and they knew they could get that. So the Romans weren't a problem. But how do you handle public opinion? How do you handle Jesus' fan base? How do you kill Jesus when just that week the city is singing his praises and recognizing him as Messiah? How do you deal with the fact that so many people want Jesus to be the new king of Israel? And of course, Jesus' popularity could also threaten the uneasy peace they had with the Romans. The last king, the one after Herod, had been banished, and a Roman governor had been installed in his place. Any talk of a new king now might bring down the wrath of the Romans, and that was a risk they were not willing to take. They wanted to keep the peace. They wanted to preserve the status quo. So, one way or another, they thought Jesus has to go, and they convinced themselves that it was for the sake of the nation. After Lazarus had been raised from the dead and Jesus' popularity was soaring, the religious authorities began to panic. The chief priests called for a quick meeting. What are we going to do, they said, for this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. So, the death of Jesus made good political sense. 
they couldn't afford to let popularity win the day, especially when the peace of the nation was at stake. The time had finally come to do something about it. But how do you get rid of Jesus when so many people like him? The Gospel of Matthew tells us about some of the discussions they had. Matthew 26, verse 3 says that the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. You see, when you're walking a political tightrope, when you're trying to balance the favor of the Romans and your influence over the public, you have to pay attention to the polls. You can't afford to lose the confidence of the public. So killing Jesus during Passover didn't seem like a good idea, not with so many people around. But then an opportunity suddenly presents itself quite unexpectedly. There was someone else who was trying to deal with the popularity of Jesus, Judas Iscariot. Now, knowing the character of Judas, it's easy to believe that he was trying to actually force Jesus' hand. He saw the people trying to crown Jesus king, but Jesus kept talking about another kingdom in the future. He said, my kingdom's not of this world. And Judas figured this was the time. Jesus should be on the throne now, and I'm guessing he thought he could force Jesus' hand. If he, if he just turned Jesus over to the authorities, he knew Jesus could stop it. He knew Jesus could fall back on heavenly power, and so maybe Judas was trying to force the situation. So, as you know, Judas was betrayed by one of his own. And you can only imagine the delight of Jesus' enemies when the opportunity suddenly presents itself. This is a PR gold mine. Because if one of Jesus' own disciples is turning against him, then it's obvious something's wrong. They could easily sell the idea that something had to be done. Obviously, Jesus is out of control. His own people are turning on him. But what nobody realized is that when Jesus finally came to the end, when the shadow of death finally caught up with him, it wasn't because he'd been outwitted. It wasn't because they'd been clever. It wasn't because Judas did something. Jesus always knew he was going to die, and he recognized the moment had finally come. All the previous attempts had failed, not because it was an accident, but because it wasn't time. You couldn't murder Jesus against his will because nobody had the power to take his life. For this reason the Father loves me, Jesus said, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. That, that's in John chapter 10. The, the, the reason they got him is because he let it happen. The hour had come. The other attempts had failed, but the timing was wrong. His ministry wasn't done. But now it was time. It was Passover, and the Passover Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, he's going to lay down his life as a sacrifice to save the world that wants him dead. The moment had come, this moment that the prophets had seen, when Messiah would be cut off, when the sacrifices would come to an end, because the sacrifice of God had come in person. Jesus laid down his life. You and I didn't take it from him. He gave it to us. And yes, it's still murder. It's still a death motivated by sin and pride and hate. It's still our fault. But make no mistake, if Jesus didn't give himself to us, this wouldn't have happened. And if God the Father had never agreed, Jesus would have never died. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. We wanted him dead. We needed a convenient moment to kill him. And what we didn't realize is that the convenient moment was his convenient moment. This had all been arranged ahead of time, far back in the far reaches of eternity. The Lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world showed up right on schedule, and he voluntarily gave his life. Greater love has no one than this, Jesus said, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Centuries before Jesus was born, one of his ancestors, a boy by the name of Joseph, was sold into slavery by his brothers. It was really a cruel thing. They, they knew he was dad's favorite and they wanted to get rid of him. But instead of killing him, they sold him into slavery in Egypt. They wanted him gone because he stood in the way. Dad's favorite, destined to rise to the top of the family, taking a place at the head of the table even though he's the little brother. So they got rid of him. They considered him dead. They figured they'd never see him again. But then the years went by and a severe famine hit the land, forcing the brothers to go and look for help. They needed food. And word on the street was Egypt had food for sale, and anybody could go and buy it. So in their worst moment of need, they suddenly find themselves in Joseph's presence. And they don't even know it's him. 
And in spite of what they did, he helps them. And you can imagine, just imagine the terror they felt when he finally revealed his identity. Hey, I'm Joseph, the one you tried to kill. That would have been the perfect opportunity for revenge. But instead, they discovered he loved them and he was eager to save them. You meant evil against me, he said. But God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. And that, hundreds of years in advance, was actually the story of Jesus. You and I meant evil against him, but he let it happen because the thought of a kingdom without you was unbearable. And the only question right now is, what are you going to do with Jesus? Thanks for listening. I'm Sean Boonstra. This has been The Voice of Prophecy. Are you searching for answers to life's most challenging questions? Answers to help you make sense of the chaos in today's world. Answers to the deepest questions in life, like, how can I know that Jesus was real? Was he more than a man, and how do I even know the stories of his time on earth are true? How can I know that the Bible is something that I can believe today? And questions like, if the Bible is true, well, what happens next after this life? Is there really a heaven? And in this world of uncertainty, you might be wondering, is there actually a chance for true happiness in this life? Disappointments like illness and loss of employment can hang like clouds over our lives. Life's daily, routine challenges can be overwhelming, and even the things that once made us happy can begin to seem empty. Is it really possible to have a happy, contented life in such an uncertain world? Well, if you're searching for answers to these and other of life's biggest questions, we are here to help. The Discover Bible Guides will help you find the answers you're looking for. Visit us at BibleStudies.com or give us a call at our toll-free number, 888-456-7933, for your free Discover Bible Guides. Study online at our website, BibleStudies.com or have the free guides mailed right to your home. There is never a cost or obligation. The Discover Bible Guides are our free gift to you. At BibleStudies.com, you will find the Discover Bible Guides in nearly 50 languages, including Spanish, Japanese, Tagalog, and Russian. Now, this is a great resource for the family member or friend that you know is looking for answers, but struggles with English. At BibleStudies.com, click on the interactive world map and find the language that you're looking for. At BibleStudies.com, you'll find answers in guides like A Second Chance at Life and Does My Life Really Matter to God? Answers to the things that matter most to you in each of the 26 Discover Bible Guides. The major themes of the Bible come to life as we study together Guides like When Jesus Comes for You and From Guilty Sinner to Forgiven Saint. And we have lessons just for the kids in your life. Your kids will love KidZone at BibleStudies.com. They'll enjoy the colorfully illustrated stories and interactive lessons in the 14 KidZone Bible Guides. And while you're online, be sure to visit us at VOP.com. At VOP.com, you'll find audio archives of this program, the latest ministry news, and resources to help you dig deep into God's Word. Begin your journey to discover answers to life's deepest questions and log on today to BibleStudies.com.